Though even now there are thousands of men in every Muslim country who can repeat the whole of Al-Quran from memory, the peculiar conditions existing in Arabia facilitated the text to a far greater extent. This is admitted even by a hostile critic. Passionately, food of poetry, but without the ready means of committing to writing. The effusions of their bards, the Arabs, had long been used to imprint these, as well as the traditions of genealogical and tribal events on the living tablets of the heart. The collective facility was thus cultivated to the highest patch, and it was applied with all the ardor of an awakened spirit to all Quran newer. And we find that very often the reason wasn't because they uh, didn't have the facility. Some of the cultures that kept a lot of records wrote down the you know, the bards and stuff. But when there's um, political, when there's intellectual and spiritual benefits that are notably reaped by either the philosophical exercise of responding to it or, or whatever the thing is, then you find that the memorization of the culture. In my culture, you meet people who know the Simpsons or know Monday Night Football or maybe Sunday, uh, maybe Sunday Football or what. You know, they know something like that better than the people going to church that actually read their Bible and know their things. So, you you know, it's whatever, whatever you want to spend your memory on. And there are certain things that are more prone to memory. Um, the Quran is easier for people. I've met non-Muslims that have heard me pray and learned Quran as a result. They've been around me and they've heard me saying the same passage and... They picked it up easier than I did. Uh, that's, um, which, which is fine, you know. That's uh, you know. Um, and certainly, the use of it is easier than uh, other texts. That, uh, but greater knowledge of Al-Quran entitled a person to be a mom. There were other reasons which made the companions vie with one another in committing the holy book to memory. The office of Imamat. Our leading with the public prayers was, as a rule, bestowed upon the man who had the greater knowledge of, all, uh, of the Holy Quran. T.R.'s Termithi, is it, I think it's Termithi, 261. All authentic reports establish this point. One report tells us that in a certain tribe, a boy of eight years old used to lead the prayers because he knew a greater portion of the Holy Quran than any other member of that tribe. The boy, Amr ibn Salama, thus relates his own story. We, i.e. the tribe which the narrator belonged, had alighted in a place by water, and people who went to the Holy Prophet passed by us. When they returned, they used to repeat to us the revelations which they had heard from the Holy Prophet. I had a good memory, so while there I committed to memory a great portion of the Holy Quran from the visitors. After a while, uh, oh, after a time, my father also went to the Holy Prophet with some people of his tribe to declare their acceptance of Islam. The Holy Prophet taught them the prayers and told them that the prayers should be led by a person who knew more of al Quran than the others. On account of what I had already committed to memory, I satisfied this condition. So they may be their imam. MSH. I don't know what that abbreviation is. 426. The distinction of having the office of a moment conferred on one was a practical incentive to a greater knowledge of Al Quran. Similarly, when a new tribe accepted Islam, the man was chosen to be sent to them to teach each. Uh, to teach them the doctrines of the principles of the new faith was the one most acquainted with Al-Quran. There are many reports which show that the reciters of Al-Quran were highly honored and respected in every way among the companions. The Prophet himself recited the Quran frequently. There were the reasons which led 
a great number of the companions of the Holy Prophet to engrave the words of Al-Quran on the tablets of their hearts. The Holy Prophet himself set an example in frequently reciting the Holy Quran in public as well as in private. It was not only in prayers that long portions of the Holy Book were recited. We have on record instances showing that the Prophet recited the Holy Quran while traveling on the back of a camel, 6624. I, I love to read scriptures and spiritual books when riding in a car. Um, he also loved to hear authors recite the Holy Word. Still none other reports, a companion is saying, the messenger of Allah said to me, recite to me the Quran. I replied, shall I recite to thee? And to thee it has been revealed. He said, I love to hear others recite it. Thereupon I began to recite the chapter entitled Women, 6633. These antidotes show that the Holy Prophet induced his companions by his own example to recite the Holy Quran. These inducements were not without their effect. The Muslim treasured up the word of God in their hearts, and its reading and teaching became very common, so common indeed that the recitation of the Quran became that when the Prophet spoke of the disappearance of the knowledge of the Quran at some future time, Ziyad, son of Labid, one of the companions, at once cried out, how could knowledge disappear, O Messenger of Allah, when we read al Quran and teach it to our women and children? TR, uh, I presume, Trimithi 39.5. This question arose out of a misapprehension of the words of the Holy Prophet, who meant not that the words of the Holy Quran would disappear, but that the people who would not act in accordance with the spirit of those words. And we start with that with the letter, of course. Um, Limits placed on the recital of Al Quran. Now, one of the things is that there are certain passages that, if we get acquainted with them, they prepare us for for the rest. If we just jump into um, what's forbidden and lawful, or I mean, that's not the right way to say because certain things you do want to get out there front and center. But um, eagerness to commit the Holy Quran to memory and to recite it frequently was in fact so great that the Holy Prophet had to place a limit as to the number of days in which the whole Quran should be recited. According to one hadith, the Prophet, on being asked to how much time one should take to finish one reading of al Quran, laid down the limit of 30 days, 66, 34. The division of al Quran into 30 parts seems to be based on this direction. This hadith of the Quran into 30 parts See, uh, well, uh, uh, sorry, with that line again. This hadith goes on to say that the minimum limit allowed was seven days. It is stated that one of the companions who finished the recitation of the whole of Al Quran once every night was expressly enjoined by him not to finish it in less than seven days. It was forbidden to go through the whole once every night. Six, uh, Bukhari sixty six thirty four. In fact, the Holy Prophet himself apportioned the Holy Quran into seven manzils, a fee, volume 9, page 39, and thus practically laid down the restriction that the Holy Quran should not be recited in less than seven days. Ibn Masud relates that the Holy Prophet said, Read al Quran in seven days, and do not read it in less than three days. A fee, volume 9, page 83. According to another report, Aisha said that the Holy Prophet did not usually finish the Quran in less than three days. A fee, volume 9, page 83. All these reports show clearly that the companions vied with one another in the frequent recitation of the Al Quran. In fact, so frequently was the recitation of the Holy Quran resorted to that the injunctions became necessary to stop a too rapid recitation. It is also clear from these reports that the whole of Al Quran was committed to memory by many of the companions. Otherwise, it could not be spoken of as being finished in a stated interval of time. That what it was recited from memory is clear from the fact that it was recited at night. Uh, persons who knew the whole Quran by heart. And some people don't even try to learn Quran until they're like in their 80s or something, and they actually have learned it. So one never knows. And honestly, if, you, if there's a good work in learning or acting or just just pick it up. Um, if you die in the process, you die in the process. But you've accomplished more because of it, even if that's the only thing. But 
started. Um, there's more to it. Uh, these conclusions are further supported by many trustworthy reports, which show that there were numerous men among the companions who could recite the whole Quran from memory. These men were called Qura, plural of Qari, the reciters that they were known to have committed the whole Quran to memory. F.B. explains the word Qura as meaning persons noted for committing al Quran to memory and for teaching it to others. Of course, the word also signified persons having a sound knowledge of al Quran. 70 of the Ura were treacherously put to death at the Be'er Ma'una by a tribe of the unbelievers. Bukhari 64 30. The fact that such a large number of them were murdered in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet shows that there were hundreds of them among the companions. The chapter headed the Qura from among the companions of the Holy Prophet. Bukhari relates several anecdotes. In the first of these, Abdullah, son of Amr, who, as we've already seen, had committed the whole of Al Quran to memory, is reported to have said, When speaking of Abdullah ibn Masud, I shall ever love him, for I heard the Holy Prophet say, Learn Al Quran from four men, from Abdullah ibn Masud, Salim, Mu'adh, and Ubay ibn Qab. This, of course, did not imply the inability on the part of other companions to teach the Holy Quran. Nor did the words mean that none of the companions besides these four retained the whole of al Quran in their memory. In fact, to be a good teacher of the Holy Quran, it was not sufficient that a person should be able to recite the Holy Book from memory. It was absolutely necessary that he should be, have a good understanding and a sound knowledge of the Holy Quran. Probably, they were named because they always tried to learn the revelations directly from the Holy Prophet. One of them Abdullah ibn Masud is reported to have said that he received over 70 chapters of the Holy Quran directly from the mouth of the Holy Prophet, Bukhari 44, 8. Other reports tell us that there were many other companions who could recite the whole of Al-Quran from memory. To take an example, Abu Bakr is not named in the above report, but it is a fact that he retained the whole of Al-Quran in his memory. It was Abu Bakr whom the Holy Prophet appointed on his deathbed to lead the public prayers. Authentic reports, as already stated, show that the person appointed to lead the prayers was always one who knew al Quran most. In cases where several persons had equal knowledge, as for instance, when they all knew the whole of al Quran by heart, other tests were applied. Now it is certain that there were men among the companions who could recite the whole of al Quran from memory. Therefore, Abu Bakr could not be appointed to lead the prayers if he did not know the whole of al Quran by heart. Hence, it follows that Abu Bakr could recite the whole of Al-Quran from memory. Similarly, Abdullah ibn Umar retained the whole of Al-Quran from his memory, finishing its recital every night, whereupon the Holy Prophet told him to finish the recital once in a month, Bakari 30, 38. In fact, many persons are mentioned as being able to recite the whole of Al-Quran from memory. In the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, among these being the four Khalafa, these Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, and such renowned companions as Talha, Saad, Ibn Mas'ud, Salim, Abu Huraira, etc. While three women, these Aisha, Hafsa, and Um Salama, are also named in the same category. Several other persons are also named from among the Ansar as being able to recite the whole of the Quran from memory. And there's listings of, for example, the the Sahaba, the Tabin, the Tabi, uh, 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 the uh, from each of the generations, there's a list of people who could recite the different, uh, you know, who knew the different modes and all that, and the, the different dialects, and there's more modes, and you know, there's, you know, but it is not to be supposed that only those persons were the reciters by whose names have been preserved to us in reports. Seventy of them were killed by treachery. 
in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet. You know, at one time, actually, we don't know that that wasn't the case otherwise. Um, and about the same number fell in the Battle of Yamama, which was fought a few months after his death. The recital of Al-Quran was necessary in public as well as private spaces. The recitation of Al-Quran and its committal to memory were not, however, only optional for Al-Quran formed a part of the public as well as the private prayers five times a day had al muslimin to pray publicly, but every public service had an additional part called the Sunnah to be performed privately while prayers in the latter portions of the night were purely of private nature. The recitation of portions of the Holy Quran in all these prayers was obligatory. You know, whether the prayer was obligatory or not, but to be part of the contact prayer. And people think, well, you're not praying. No, no, it's praying even more from the heart than letting your mind wander. And, um, and thus, every Muslim had a necessity to repeat certain portions of it every day. Now it is an established fact that generally very long portions were recited in the prayers, especially in those said during the light, that latter part of the night. The Holy Prophet himself is related to have often recited the long chapters in the beginning of Al-Quran in his Tahajjud prayers. His companions also follow this example. Thus, one companion is said to have an antidote left of him. Hmm, rumbling, tumble here. Um, and to have recited it in his Tahajjud prayers. The second chapter, which forms the twelfth part of Al-Quran, even in the public prayers, long chapters were recited. The evening prayers are... the least suited for the citation of the longest chapters. But even in these, the Holy Prophet recited such chapters as the Torah, chapter 52, Bukhari 1099. One companion recited the second chapter in prayers at the nightfall, and a complaint was made against him by one who was tired by a whole day's labor, 1060. In their private prayers also, the companions recited long chapters. Thus, not only was it necessary that every one of them should commit the whole or a certain portion of the Holy Quran to memory. But the part was so committed, was always kept fresh in the mind by a constant recitation of the prayers. One hadith relates how a certain chapter, Qaf, was learned by heart by a companion from its frequent recitation in the Friday gatherings. Muslim 713 MS um, In fact, if there had been no other means of giving public publicity to al Quran, its mere recitation and prayers was sufficient to give it such publication as would have guarded it against any possible alteration or loss. And the fact that there was the ability of the crowd to correct, as opposed to like in the Zoroastrian tradition and stuff like this, because um, the Mobibs didn't allow cor correction and you actually did see that some changes occurred over time because of that, among the Parsis in particular. I think mostly the Parsis, uh, you can establish that that happened. Um, there is only one hadith, the evidence of which is considered to be conflicting with that furnished by all the hadith cited above. It runs as follows. Anas reported that the Holy Prophet died while none had collected Abraham with the exception of four men, Abu Darda and Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Zaid ibn Thabit and Abu Sa'id, Bukhari 66.8, at a report of the same effect narrated by the same authority. The name of Ubay is mentioned instead of Abu Darda. This hadith does not speak of the committing of al Quran to memory, but of the collection of its manuscripts. There is no doubt that the word jama' collecting is used in hadith in both cases, collecting of the manuscripts and the retaining of the whole of al Quran in memory. But the latter significance is out of the question here, for it is a fact established beyond all doubt that a very large number of companions knew the whole of al Quran by heart. Nor can an objection be raised at the first significance on the ground that if the manuscripts of the whole of Quran had already been collected by these four men, why Abu Bakr and Umar were so anxious for its collection, when many of the Qur'a 
about the battle of Yamama and why Zaid, uh, why Zaid considered it a very heavy tax when he was chosen for collecting the scattered manuscripts of the Holy Quran into one volume. The fact is that Zaid sought the manuscripts that were written in the presence and by the direction of the Holy Prophet. Even if we admit for the sake of argument the existence of certain differences in the various reports quoted above, the one conclusion upon which they all agree is absolutely certain be that among the companions of the Holy Prophet there were persons who retained in memory the whole of al Quran as taught by the Holy Prophet, and who at his death had the whole of it engraved on the tablets of their hearts. All this was done in obedience to the injunctions of the Holy Prophet, who laid great stress upon the reciting of al Quran and the committing of it to memory, and these measures to guard the texts of the Holy Quran were, in addition to writing, it may also be pointed out here that the gradual revelation of al Quran afforded great facility in committing it to memory. The interval between the revelation of two verses or two chapters afforded the companions an opportunity to repeat it as often as they liked. The entire Quran was revealed in a long period of 23 years, and if, a Muslim, if Muslim boys of the age of 10 or 12 years can even now commit the whole Quran to memory within two or th uh, within one or two years, the Arab possessors of wonderfully retentive memories to whom the importance of Al-Quran was far greater than any Muslim of a latter age. Well, not any Muslim of a latter age, but, you know, let's cut the spirit of the whole thing. Um, would not find it difficult to memorize it within the long period of 23 years, especially when it was given to them gradually. Well, difficulty, but it would be something they could accomplish. Because it was apparent that they did have difficulty of it. Um... But, yeah. Three, the arrangement of verses and chapters was the Prophet's own work. The Holy Quran was revealed piecemeal during a long period of extending over 23 years. Some of the chapters were revealed complete, but the revelation of many others was fragmentary and extended over long periods. Now the arrangement of chapters and verses in the copies of the Holy Quran at present in the hands of the Muslim does not follow the order of revelation. The important question before us, therefore, is whether the Holy Prophet himself arranged the verses and chapters in an order different from that of their revelation. And if so, whether the present arrangement is the work of the Holy Prophet. In other words, was the Holy Prophet left by the Holy In other words, was the Holy Quran left by the Holy Prophet in the same condition as regards the arrangement of its verses and chapters as that in which we now find it. R. Is its present condition different from that in which the Holy Prophet left it? Internal evidence about the arrangement. That the arrangement of the verses and chapters of the Holy Quran was affected by the Holy Prophet under the guidance of divine revelation is shown in the first place by the Holy Quran itself. There we read, surely on us rests the collection of it and the reciting of it. So when we have recited it, follow its recitation. 75, 17, 18. This is one of the very earliest revelations showing that the collection of the Holy Quran, that is the gathering into one whole with an arrangement of its various parts, was according to the divine scheme to be brought about by the guidance of divine revelation. Arrangement and collection were, therefore, as much the work of divine revelation as the reading of a verse to the Holy Prophet, i.e. its revelation. Another ch chapter revealed a little later we have, and those who disbelieve say, Why has not Al-Quran been revealed to him all at once? Thus, that we may establish thy heart by it, and we have arranged it well in arranging. 2532. The Quran itself, therefore, makes it clear that its collection and its arrangement were also brought about by divine revelation. It should be borne in mind that the word Jama in the above verse implies both collection and arrangement, since no collection could be brought about without an arrangement. These verses describe the arrangement and collection as a process different from the revelation of a verse to the Holy Prophet, thus showing that from the first it was meant that the verses and the chapters of the Holy Quran should be arranged in an order different from that of the revelation. If the order in collection were be the same as the order of the reading of the different verses to the Holy Prophet, i.e. the order of their revelation collecting and reading, would not have been described 
as two different things. Historical evidence as to arrangement. History bears ample testimony to the truth of the above assertion made in the Holy Quran, and we meet with the clearest proof in authentic and reliable reports that the Holy Prophet left at his death the complete Quran with the same arrangement of the verses and chapters as we have now in every Arabic Quran. We will consider the arrangement of verses and that of chapters separately, and in each inquiry we shall have to discuss the following points. Was any arrangement followed by the Prophet himself and by his companions in his lifetime? Well, that can be considered as a separate list to back it up. Uh, well, I mean, to make the issue even clearer. Was that arrangement different from the order in which the verses of the chapters were revealed? Does the present arrangement differ from that followed by or which existed in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet? Oh, question three is kind of um, well. I guess it's. I guess it does have different elements of one rather than one being split into two, and that really, um, that such a large book treating so many and such varied subjects should have been committed to memory and regularly recited in and outside prayers and taught by one man to another without there being any settled arrangement of its parts is a most preposterous position, but there is hardly a Christian critic of Islam who has not advanced it. The grounds for this assertion are the same in every case. Not the least regard is paid to historical evidence, and mere assertion that no arrangement is discoverable in the verses and chapters is made the basis on which the proposition rests. The following short paragraph from Muir's introduction to his life of Muhammad is not only illustrative of the assertions of the Christian critics in general, but it also shows how the author himself has evaded the historical evidence. We are not, however, to assume that the entire Quran was at this period repeated in any fixed order. The present compilation, indeed, is held by the Basilian to follow the arrangement prescribed by Muhammad. Well, then it would be the fixed order if it was prescribed. Um, and early traditions might appear to imply some known sequence, but this cannot be admitted, for had any fixed order been observed or sanctioned by the Holy Prophet, it would unquestionably have been preserved in the subsequent collection. Now, the Quran, as handed down to our time, follows the disposition of its several parts. No intelligible arrangement, whatever, either the subject of the time, and it is inconceivable that Muhammad should have enjoined its recital, invariably, in this order. Well, if you follow the theme, how the themes work into each other and the sound and stuff, what other order would have made so much sense upon those two issues? We must even doubt whether the number of suar or chapters was determined by Muhammad as we now have them. The internal sequence at any rate of the contents of the several suar cannot, in most cases, have been intended by the Prophet. Now, there's narration to the contrary, which is, you know, uh, some of these claims against, but... Some of the footnotes given under this paragraph show the struggle in the writer's mind between historical facts and religious prejudice. Thus, while denying the existence of any fixed order in Al-Quran in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, Muir had to admit that we read of certain companions who could repeat the whole Quran in a given time, which might be held to imply some unusual connection of the parts. In another footnote, it is admitted that there were four or five persons who could repeat with scrupulous accuracy the whole of Al-Quran and several others who could very nearly repeat the whole before Muhammad's death, again while denying that even the number of suar was determined by the Holy Prophet. He adds the following footnote. But there is reason to believe that the, thick, the chief suar, including all passages in most common usage, were fixed and known 
by name or other distinctive mark. Some are spoken of in early and well-authenticated traditions as having been so referred to by the Muhammad himself. Thus he recalled his fugitive followers at the discomfiture of Honain by shouting to them as the men of the Surah Ba'or Oh, Surah 2. Um, Baqarah. Several persons are stated by tradition to have learned by heart a certain number of Suwar in Muhammad's lifetime. Thus, Abdullah bin Masood learned 70 Suwar from the Prophet's own mouth, and Muhammad on his deathbed repeated 70 Suwar, among which were the seven long ones. These traditions signify a recognized division of at least some parts of the revelation into suwar, if not the usual order in repeating the suwar themselves. The liturgical use of the suwar by Muhammad must, no doubt, have in some measure fixed their form and probably also their sequence. In connection with the same subject, it is said on another footnote that the tradition just cited as to the number of suwar which some of the companions could repeat, and which Muhammad himself repeated on his deathbed, also imply the existence of such suwar in a complete and finished form. Thus, almost every remark made in the paragraph quoted first is contradicted in the footnotes on the basis of historical facts met with in authentic reports. Though the statements in the footnotes are made reservedly, yet the contradictions are too clear to escape unnoticed by any careful reader, and the struggle in the writer's mind can be easily discerned in the text is asserted that there was no fixed order or arrangement of the verses and chapters of the Holy Quran, and historical evidence is produced in the footnote showing that there was a connection. The text makes the allegiance that even the Sawar were not distinctly marked out by the Holy Prophet, and their number was not determined by him, and the footnotes bring forward historical testimony to the fact that there was a recognized division and that the form of chapters was no doubt fixed. The reservations contained in such expressions as some part and some measure were only natural, considering the allegations in the text. It can easily be seen that if 70 suar, including seven long ones, existed in a complete and finished form, as the footnotes admit, and there is no evidence showing that the remaining 44 short suar, which were no doubt generally recited in prayers, did not exist in the same form, the presumption will be that all the suwar existed in a complete and finished form. This conclusion becomes clearer when it is borne in mind that this same writer has thus admitted that there were several companions who could repeat not only